Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Geoffroy Couteau. And so this talk is going to be about encryption switching protocols. This is a joint work with Thomas Peters and David Moncheval. So secure two-body computation address the, addresses the challenge of computing some public function f. So you have two players, Alice and Bob, who each hold some private uh, input x1 and x2, and they would like to compute f on those inputs without revealing anything more than this result. In particular, they don't want to reveal anything at all on their own input. And there have been various methods that have been designed in the past to uh, address this cryptographic challenge based on a large variety of tools and primitives. One of the most common primitives that have been used to build uh, two-body computation protocols is homomorphic encryption. So quickly, uh, a public key homomorphic encryption scheme is a public key encryption scheme, so you have a public key which allows you to encrypt and a secret key which allows you to decrypt. And you have in addition an algorithm eval, which takes as input an encrypted message m, uh, the public key and some function from some class of function, and outputs an encryption of, this, uh, of f of m. So it allows you to evaluate functions on the plain text without having to know the secret key of the scheme. Um, it's fairly easy to see how we can build uh, two-body computation out of homomorphic encryption. So if you have a homomorphic encryption scheme for some class of function, think for example of linear operations, then you can let the players encrypt their input, broadcast those homomorphic encryption, homomorphically and, and locally compute, evaluate the function on those encrypted inputs, and they end up with uh, an encryption of the output, and then there is methods to recover the uh, output from an encrypted output uh, in using a joint protocol. And so if, for example, now you want to build a two-party computation protocol uh, for like linear operations, then you can use the pi encryption scheme, which is li linearly homomor homomorphic. And if you want to uh, evaluate a function which is like exponentiation, monomials, or any product function, then you can lay let the players use use the uh, Audi Marcotto system, which is multiplicatively homomorphic. Uh, if you want to do more, uh, well, obviously, it's way harder. If, for example, you want to be able to evaluate both additions and multiplications, then if you can do so, you can evaluate any circuit in a gate-by-gate -gate fashion. But it's still possible, and it's called fully homomorphic encryption. Um, so fully homomorphic encryption lets you evaluate any function given a cipher text without uh, having to decrypt the cipher text. But current implementation of fully homomorphic encryption scheme are quite slow. So the natural approach uh, for building secure topic computation out of homomorphic encryption is to say instead, well, let's forget about having an encryption scheme which will be multiplicatively homomorphic. We'll just assume that we have an additively homomorphic encryption scheme and we will evaluate all the additive gates of our protocol uh, homomorphically and locally, but we will pay for each multiplicative gate using a dedicated multiplication protocol. So this will cost interaction on uh, and, um, and communication. Still, this uh, way of building two-body computation schemes um, has produced extremely efficient protocols. So it's a, it's a quite efficient method. Um, but in, in this work, we try to have some different approach. And so our, our core observation was, well, we already have a so additively homomorphic encryption scheme, which do allow us to evaluate homomorphically and locally any kind of linear operations without interactions, communication, whatever. And we also already have multiplicatively homomorphic encryption scheme, which let us evaluate multiplica multiplications, exponentiation, and so on, locally and homomorphically. So what if we could somehow make them work together? And by make them work together, I mean, could we build some uh, encryption switching protocol, which is a protocol that will take as input a ciphertext encrypting some message M, and output a ciphertext encrypting the same message M, but with the other crypto system. And the core security requirement for such a switch protocol is that during, so this will be a two-party protocol, and during this two-party protocol, no players must learn anything about the message M. 
the plain text M, which is contained both in the input ciphertext and the, in the output ciphertext. And if we had such a switch protocol, it's quite easy to see that we can easily have a secure party computation for any function. You write your circuit as layers of linear operations and uh, multiplicative operations. Each time you want to evaluate uh, linear operations, you, you use um, like pi encryptions of the, the inputs and you evaluate homomorphically these, op these operations. And each time you need to go to the next layer, then you just have to switch to multiplicatively homomorphic ciphertext and you can keep on evaluating everything homomorphically and so on until you get an encryption of the output. And so, okay, but what would be the benefit of doing so? Uh, because we already have, as I said, extremely efficient uh, multi-party computation protocols uh, based on um, paying for each multiplicative gates. So here the advantage is essentially that you, you won't have to pay for each multiplicative gates. So think, think for example of a circuit where at some point many multiplicative gates are grouped together. You can think for example of a circuit which at some point computes an exponentiation. This involves many multiplications and instead of paying in terms of communication for each of those multiplicative gates, here you will just have to switch to, um, to a multiplicatively homomorphic uh, encryption scheme, evaluate everything locally, and then switch back. So essentially, doing two-party computation out of uh, two complementary homomorphic encryption scheme together with a non-encryption switching protocol uh, allows to have two-party computation protocols with, which might be sublinear in the size of the circuit if the circuit is well structured, like the multiplication gates are kind of grouped together, and so on. Okay, so I, I said that uh, we, we, want, we would like to build such, such an encryption switching protocol. This is our goal in this work for the uh, pi encryption scheme and the algama encryption scheme. So let me present them in slightly more details. So the pi crypto system is uh, a semantically secure crypto system whose semantic security relies on the decisional composite residuosity assumption which states that if you take uh, an RSA modulus n, the product of two safe prime, it's computationally infeasible to distinguish n's power from random elements over the n squared. Uh, on the other end, we have the L gamma crypto system, whose semantic security rely on the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, which states that you cannot distinguish uh, tuples of the form g, g to the a, g to the b, g to the a times b from uniformly random tuples, and which, uh, which is multiplicatively homomorphic. And the important thing is the pi crypto system allows you to encrypt any plain text uh, over Zn, while the uh, Algama crypto system allows you to encrypt, well, any plain text which belongs to a group over which uh, the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption is believed to hold. And you might already see the problem here when I ask, can we build encryption switching protocol? The question that should come first is, does that even make sense? So because my encryption switching protocol ideally will take an encryption of some message and output another encryption of the same message. So it must at least be meaningful to talk about an encryption with the other scheme of the same message. So we must at least have encryption scheme where the two plain text spaces have some intersection. And moreover, we really need that the two plain text spaces are essentially the same. Because if it's not the case, um, and our encryption switching protocol could be used to distinguish during a two-party computation protocol between inputs on which we can switch, which does belong to the intersection of the plain text spaces, from inputs on which we cannot switch, which would cause a failure. And so this will leak information on the uh, inputs of the players in our two-party computation protocol. So what we would need would be uh, to have first two crypto system, an additively homomorphic one and a multiplicatively homomorphic one, that operate on the same plain text space. And unfortunately, while pi -A does allow you uh, to encrypt over uh, Zn, the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption doesn't hold over Zn, nor does it hold over Zn star, the uh, set of invertible elements over Zn. And so um, our first task, if we want even our goal to make sense, will be to design a variant of the Elgamar crypto system, which remains multiplicatively homomorphic, 
but which will allow us to encrypt message over ZM, so as to complement the BioCrypto system. Does that make sense? Okay. So, we will start with a slightly um, a simpler goal, which would be to design an L gamma like multiplicatively homomorphic crypto system over ZN star. And so let's dig a bit into the structure of ZN star. So you can see ZN star as being divided into four equal size parts. Uh, so the two columns here correspond to element having Jacobi symbol one or minus one while the two lines here corresponds to element having what I call sine one or minus one. And the uh, group of elements with Jacobi symbol minus one here is JN, this is a larger subgroup uh, over ZN star. And so, as our goal is to build an L gamma like encryption scheme, we need to have some hardness assumption to rely on. So let's see what is hard about that over ZN star. So not DDH, as uh, we said before, DDH does not hold over uh, ZN star, but the decisional definement assumption is believed to hold over the subgroup of squares, even if the player knows the factorization, because it reduces to uh, the decisional defilement assumption over the subgroup of squares of both ZP and ZQ, where P and Q are the factors of our models. Moreover, it is believed to be computationally infeasible to distinguish between squares and minus squares over JN. This is the uh, quadratic residuosity assumption, and so, but this holds when players do not know the factorization. It, it's at least uh, easier than factorization. Computing the Jacobi symbol is always easy, uh, even if players do not know the factorization. So the hard task essentially will be to hide this Jacobi symbol when encrypting the plain text from ZN star. Because you can easily see that if we can encrypt with Elgamal over the squares, if it's impossible to distinguish squares from minus squares, then essentially it means that if no players know the factorization, we can use an Elgamal like crypto system over uh, JN. Um, everything works fine. The hard part is uh, encrypting and hiding the Jacobi symbol of the plain text. So let's see how we will do it. Um, so to encrypt a message M, we first add to the public key some uniformly random element with Jacobi symbol minus one. So from the second column here, and a generator G of JN. And with a decomposition of M will be a tuple A M1, so that A is a uniformly random value which will be even if M has Jacobi symbol one, and odd if, J, if M has Jacobi symbol minus one, so that key to the A has the same Jacobi symbol than M. And M1 is the value that satisfies M equals key to the A times M1, and you can easily see that M1 always has Jacobi symbol minus one, because the product of two elements with Jacobi symbol, let's say uh, alpha and beta is alpha beta, so. It, so this M1 part does belong to JN, so we can simply encrypt it over JN using a standard Elgamal uh, crypto system. The hard part is adding this key to the A, and this is done as follow. While it is easy to distinguish between key to the 2x and key to the 2x plus one, this is just computing the Jacobi symbol, uh, it's believed to be infeasible to distinguish between our two lines here, so we will encode this uh, key to the A as G to the A. So that key to the A as Jacobi symbol one is equivalent to G to the A being a square. So from G to the A, you cannot recover the Jacobi symbol unless you break the quadratic residuosity assumption. And it's quite easy to see that this encryption remains multiplicatively homomorphic because that one is multiplicatively homomorphic and that one we just change the basis. So what remains to see is whether we can decrypt that. Because it looks like we, would, we might have to compute some discrete log here to decrypt. So the intuitive way of avoiding to, have to compute some discrete log would be to add, uh, let's say, the discrete log of key in base G to our secret key, so as to, re to construct key to the A from G to the A using this discrete log. But this doesn't make sense as uh, key and G doesn't belong to the same group at all. G is the generator of JN, key has Jacobi symbol minus one. But what we do is essentially that, 
mod p and mod q. So we generate key by picking two uniformly random value t1 and t2 with opposite parities. And we set key to be g to the t1 mod p and g to the t2 mod q. And we reconstruct key mod n using the Chinese remainder theorem. And as t1 and t2 have opposite parities, this is guaranteed to be an element with Jacobi symbol minus one. But now, from g to the a, using t1 and t2, we can construct key to the a mod p and mod q, and again reconstruct key to the a um, using the Chinese remainder theorem. While the second part is quite easy to decrypt, so we just, we just reconstruct this key to the a, decrypt this second part, and recover the message m. Okay, so this works, it, it's fine, but I promised Zn, um, for the moment, we only have an encryption scheme over Zn star. So a first step, a very small step toward getting Zn would be to add a zero. So that's what we will do first. How to, have a how to build a multiplicatively homomorphic encryption scheme over Zn star union zero. And the trick here is quite simple. Any element over Zn star union zero will be encoded as a pair of elements, both over Zn star, we, uh, so that we don't lose the, multiplicatively home, the multiplicative properties. And so to encode a message m, an encoding would be either m1, if m is um, a non-zero, non -zero. and if m is zero, then our encoding will be random and random. Why? Because then if you multiply 10 by, um, 10 by 10 many such encodings, either the first part is what you're looking for, the product of all the messages, or at some point, some random value happened in the computation, it, and it's a uniformly random value that loses all information on the message. And the second part of the encoding allows you to check whether this is a zero, in which case you would uh, have um, a random value, or it, uh, all, the, all the messages that were multiplied were non-zero, in which case the second part will be a one. And so the, what we do is simply, we encode its message from Zn star union zero as a pair of me message over Zn star, and we encrypt both, uh, element, uh, both element of our pair with the schemes that we just designed over Zn star. This is still not Zn, but almost. And by almost, I mean that if no player knows the factorization, then it's computationally infeasible to find an element which will be in Zn, but not in Zn star union zero. Because any such element is a multiple of either P or Q, and so finding such an element is perfectly equivalent to uh, finding the factorization of M. And so, it is possible to assume that no players will know the factorization by relying, by using a threshold encryption scheme instead of just a standard encryption, encryption scheme. So in our con construction, rather than using a standard homomorphic encryption scheme, we will use threshold schemes in which the secret key of the scheme is secretly shared between the two players so that each player indivi individually has no knowledge on the full secret key. And then decryption of some message is performed uh, by using a joint decryption procedure, which is a, an interactive protocol which outputs the plain text contained in the cipher text. And such um, distributed description procedure are known for most homomorphic public encryption schemes. And so that's all. What we can do is simply we use a threshold scheme instead of a standard scheme, and we can just assume that it, everything will be exactly as if uh, our Elgamal scheme over Zn star union zero was in fact a scheme over Zn, and we know that with overwhelming probability, this won't cause any error in the protocol, and this can be formally proven. Okay, so now we, we kind of have an Elgamal, uh, a multiplicatively homomorphic variant of the Elgamal encryption scheme, and we can assume that it works over Zn somehow, so our goal was to build an encryption switching protocol out of that. And so rather than presenting the full construction, I will give a, a toy scheme, uh, which will give you the intuition uh, on how we can do that. And in particular, our toy scheme won't even handle the case where M is zero. But the core ID in this encryption switching protocol is if we have an additive scheme on, an, on a multiplicative scheme, 
they are likely to have very different algebraic properties. However, they must share at least one common algebraic property, which is that in both schemes, you can have external multiplication, either on the additive scheme by using a square multiple uh, 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 algorithm, or uh, on, in the multiplicative scheme by just like un encrypting your external value before per uh, and then performing the multiplication. Okay, so, so we have two players and they start, they start with an additive encryption of some message M and to make the presentation simpler, we in assume here that M is non-zero and the players know that. The first player picks a uniformly random value R and using the fact that he can do external multiplication on the additive scheme, he multiplies R inside this encryption of M, which gives an encryption of R times M, and he sends a multiplicatively homomorphic encryption um, of R minus one. Then both players perform a joint encryption protocol using the, their shares of the secret key on uh, the additive scheme, think for example of the pi scheme, so that only the second players learn the result. And as we assumed here that M was non-zero, this R times M leaks no information on M. It's a uniformly random value over than, than N star. Um, and so with this R times M, we can again use this external, um, this external multiplication, but on the other scheme. So the second player simply multiplies this R times M uh, in the encryption of R minus one and sends back the result, which is an encryption of M. And that's it. So that's a toy scheme. You can see many problems here related to the fact that we would have to randomize things, but okay. And so what do we have to do next to uh, solve all the other problems related to encryption switching protocol? Well, first we have to deal with the other direction, uh, which essentially requires to build a joint decryption procedure to the, um, to the multiplicative scheme that we designed. We need to extend the construction so that it uh, handles the case where the plain text is zero, so that adds some more technicalities in the paper. Proof formally that if we have all of that complementary homomorphic encryption scheme and um, encryption switching protocol, we can evaluate any function. That's quite long and technical, but there is nothing particularly um, exceptional with this, with this. And add security against malicious adversaries. And this is uh, quite interesting because at some point it requires to be able to prove statements of the form, two different um, encryption schemes do encrypt the same message. And no efficient proof for such a statement do appear in the literature, so we had to design one, and it appears that uh, this gives a new zero-knowledge proof for various more classical statements. So this is a side contribution of the paper. And that's all, thank you for your attention.